All right, everyone. Welcome to our next discussion with one of our one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, a full court press author, Janice Mueller, who's here today. We're going to have a discussion on a fantastic two volume patent law treatise known as Mueller on Patent Law. So what we're going to do today over the next 30 ish minutes or so is we're going to have a nice, light, but interesting and fun conversation about how the book came to fruition. We're going to get to know the author and we're just going to learn all about what she has to share, insights of how the publication came about, so on and so forth. So going from here, I'm going to, you know, of course, use my good Southern manners and make a proper introduction of our author. Thank so you. let's move directly over to our next slide. So Janice Mueller has co-founded the Chisholm Patent Academy. And if you're not familiar with the Academy, you will be by the time this presentation is over. Uh, she co-teaches in a small group and teaches the universe all about the field of advanced patent law. Um, she also <laughs> teaches individuals how to use patent law to corporate clients. So from 2004 to 2011, she was also a tenured professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and she has taught and wrote in the field of IP law with an emphasis in U.S. and comparative patent law. She's also taught at a broad array of other universities, including the John Marshall Law School, the Suffolk University, University of Kentucky, and the William Mitchell College of Law. And we're not done yet with this fantastic introduction. Uh, Mueller is also a registered U.S. patent attorney and a chemical engineer. She began her legal career as a patent agent with Murchison Gould in Minneapolis. Now, after law school, before all of this, these fantastic accomplishments first occurred, she also clerked with the Honorable Giles S. Rich at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. I can't wait to hear more about that. She litigated patent and copyright infringement cases also as an honors program trial attorney at the US DOJ before coming into, once again, the legal academia world in 1995. Now, I hope that was an introduction worthy of you, Ms. Mueller. <laughs> um, before we dive into questions, I also want to remind everyone, I skipped over the announcement, and I know my boss is in the background going, make the housekeeping announcements. So while I promise that this webinar will be informative, it is not available for CLE credit. If you do desire free CLE credit, consider checking out one of our free CLE webinars available for you at fastcase.com forward slash webinars. We offer one free CLE credit granting session every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But with that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to my dear colleague Morgan Wright to start asking questions and start our roundtable. What do you think? Sounds good. Thanks, Ken. So my name is Morgan Wright. I'm the publisher at Full Court Press, which is um, Fast Case's publishing arm, and that's the name of our imprint. Um, I should also say that throughout the program, if you have a question um, for Ms. Mueller, you can type that into the dashboard in your GoToMeeting um, program. And if we have time, we'll go through some at the end or throughout the program if they're relevant to what we're speaking about at the time. So with that, I'm going to get right into the question. So um, Janice, what was the origin story for deciding to write this treatise? Um, what kind of set you off along that path? It's a giant undertaking. The book is quite large. <laughs> Well, Morgan and Ken, first of all, thank you so much for that very thorough introduction. I, I hope I can live up to it. Um, and thanks everybody who's out there for joining us this afternoon. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, a technical glitch on my end made us start a couple minutes late, but uh, welcome. And I'm here in my home office um, with my guardian angel who uh, watches over my right shoulder and this is actually one of my favorite paintings. And the title is, The Secret is Beyond Me. And sometimes that's the way I feel about patent law. But I'm confident that we're going to dispel those, those doubts and concerns in our conversation this afternoon. So Morgan, as to your question, um, what is the story of the treatise? Well, the story that's either really audacious naive or just plain crazy um, but the goal has always been to help my reader and in the beginning um, that was to to help my law students um, as ken mentioned i was a full-time law professor for 16 years and when i started teaching in the mid 90s there were no single volume nutshells uh, horn books primers to help patent law students 
um, understand and put into context the cases that they were reading in their patent law casebook. For that matter, there were not many patent law casebooks either, and a lot of schools did not even offer patent law. You were lucky if your law school had an IP survey course. But things started to change in the late 1990s around the year 2000. The Federal Circuit had been formed in 1982, and over the years it was gaining prominence as the uh, go-to powerhouse for patent law in the United States. Um, and and um, by the year 2000, I would say, patent law had become a rather trendy practice area. It was no longer just sort of a green eye shade, very arcane specialty. Um, so around that time, a publisher, a legal education publisher, asked me to write a horn book geared at law students uh, to help them understand patent law. And I did that. And I'm happy to say that that book is now in its sixth edition. Um, so the publisher was happy with, with that, as, as was I, and then at some point asked me to take on a much larger project. And that was to write a comprehensive multi-volume uh, treatise about patent law geared at patent practitioners. Um, and so much more in, in depth, much more detailed. And that's what I've been doing for about the last uh, five, 10 years. But I'm really, really delighted that my treatise, Mueller on Patent Law, which is a two volume treatise uh, for practitioners now um, has its home with Fastcase. And it's available in two formats. Digitally, um, a reader can subscribe and read the treatise online as part of their subscription to the Fastcase Fast legal research platform. But also, um, Fastcase is one of the legal publishers that still believes in print books. And so um, the treatise is available in hard copy. And um, that's from Fastcase Imprint, which is Full Court Press, and uh, Morgan is the head of the imprint. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, I also, one last point on this, I think it's great that Fastcase basically offers you both versions for the price of one. So if you've subscribed to the digital version, they will send you a complimentary copy of the print treatise and vice versa. And I think there are really good reasons to have access to both formats. And so we'll talk more about that as we get into, into the conversation. Excellent. I also, while we're on the subject of, so this of course is a nice a little screenshot of a description of the two volume treatise. I also wanna point people to, if you are already excited about purchasing this book, I do have a link here for you. We'll send out this slide deck after the session. There's a nice little quick link here for you so you can get, you can dive right into both volumes. I have personally read both volumes cover to cover and I am quite excited about the book and, or the books and the session, I have to admit. I'm somewhat gleeful. So I will try to, I will try to simmer down my enthusiasm, but I'm so excited to hear. Okay. So next question, if you're ready, if I may. So my next question is, where do you see this treatise fitting into the current landscape of patent law publications in general? Well, great question, Ken. You know, does the world really need one more patent law treatise? And my answer emphatically is yes. Uh, and let me tell you why. Patent practitioners and treatise writers are confronted today with a tsunami of information and advice about patent law, about how to practice it. Uh, we're seeing this information coming at us through blog posts, emails, specialty journals, Twitter feeds, podcasts. Um, uh, it goes on and on. And what I've tried to do here is provide a filter, um, a, a structured, organized filter through which to absorb and make sense of this flood of, con of content. Um, this is a selective, curated collection of information. I'll be very candid. I, I don't cover the waterfront in terms of discussing every patent case that's ever been decided. 
Uh, there are other treatises that do a uh, incredible job with um, a task that large. Uh, I'm not quite as ambitious, but what I do have is, um, based on my 30 years of practicing and teaching and writing about patent law um, and, and reading decisions of the Federal Circuit, I have tried to provide not, not a historical encyclopedia, but a curated guide to the cases and the issues that I feel really are the most significant for good or bad um, in terms of patent law and patent law practice. Yeah, I think I, I love that answer because for me, my biggest takeaway, the reason why I was so excited about your, your two volume treatise was that I felt as if I could go out immediately and sort of dive into the patent law world. It, I, the word right. that I used to describe <laughs> to other people is approachable. I just love that about it. It's, it's oh, you can thank you. put the time to make the book relatable to people who may not already be, you know, in depth patent practitioners, if I may add that as well. Thank you. Uh, moving right along a little bit more about the nature of the book, uh, to what extent do does the treaties um, just straight out report on um, the black letter law of state and federal decisions, I'm sorry, federal decisions at the Supreme Court or the Federal Circuit, <laughs> and to what extent is it a commentary on those decisions, or do you espouse your own views, or is it just a restatement of the law? Well, I, I think it would be quite surprising and, and odd if after my 30 years in this business, if I did not have my own opinions, sometimes pretty strong opinions about the way that particular cases have come out or issues have been developed or not developed. Um, and, and I certainly share many of those opinions in my treatise. But first and foremost, um, I'm here to help, and my treatise is here to help the reader. And I think I best do that by accurately analyzing and reporting and synthesizing what is the current state of the law? What is the binding precedent on this particular question? And where we have conflicts, identify those and possibly speculate about where things might be going in the future. But the bottom line is to, to provide a good statement of you know, what is the law on point about these patent law issues at this time? Now, to the extent that I do share my own opinions, I always label them very clearly. Anytime um, I'm talking about my own views or my own opinions, um, you will see a paragraph that begins with the words in the view of this author, comma, and so on. And sometimes I put those statements in the main body of text of the treatise, but probably more often I put them in the footnotes. So pro tip, read the footnotes. I'm a big footnoter. Um, having been a law professor for a while, you, uh, you get used to that. And if you're using the online format of the treatise, you're only gonna see footnote numbers you have to click on a footnote number to be jumped to the text of that footnote where you might see my paragraph about in the view of this author. So uh, just keep in mind, footnotes are important. Speaking a little bit about the digital versus the print, we've had some audience questions about the update schedule for the treaties. And I have some good news, which is even though this book just came out in print in January, we have already <laughs> been updating it in the digital version. So one of the benefits of subscribing to the book on Fastcase is you subscribe for that one year period, but then any updates that come out as um, Janice is producing them, you immediately have access to. So um, it's a real benefit. Um, and Ken, do you wanna go ahead and uh, ask the next question? I would love to. I would also add before I ask the next question that a great addition to the uh, digital version, speaking of footnotes, is that the cases referenced in the footnotes are linked to the system within Fastcase. So if you are accessing both Fastcase and the two volume treatise through Fastcase, you get that nice cross-linking tie-in, um, which as a researcher can always help you. So next question. So Mueller on patent law focuses on patent law precedent from the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So what is the significance of the Federal Circuit to patent law? 
Well, thanks, Ken. And I agree with you. It's, it's great to have those hot links to the cases and also your hot link, if they're not actually in front of you, to the patent diagrams, which are often very important to understanding the uh, facts of a case. And it was a lot of work, I know, to, uh, to include those in the treatise, but they are there. So, um, and then the question was, I've already forgotten. <laughs> Ken, what was the question? I got off track. The question was, uh, what is the significance of the federal circuit oh, to PEM? Yes. I got you. Oh, my goodness. Of course, of course. Well, highly, highly significant. Um, for all practical purposes, the federal circuit operates as the Supreme Court of patent law in the United States. And what do I mean by that? Well, in an average year, our U.S. Supreme Court might consider one, two, or three in a big year uh, patent cases. But the Federal Circuit, at the close of fiscal year 2020, had over 800, 800 patent law cases on its docket. So for practical purposes, you know, um, what the Federal Circuit says is going to be the law of the land when it comes to patent law, except for those very rare cases, one or two a year where the Supreme Court steps in, for better or worse, and, um, and reviews what the Federal Circuit has done. The Federal Circuit, as I mentioned before, it was created in 1982, and um, policymakers really wanted to promote innovation in this country, and well, not just domestically, but internationally as well. And one of the ways that they, they um, proposed to do that was create one single federal appellate court, which would have exclusive jurisdiction nationwide over all patent appeals, whether they be from the federal district court or the patent office. So, <clears throat> for example, um, prior to the federal circuit's creation, you had all the what I call the regional circuits, first, second, third, et cetera, uh, deciding patent law cases. And let's take, for example, a uh, famous Supreme Court case decided in 1966, Graham versus John Deere. The patent in suit there was directed to the shank of a plow. So the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit had considered this patent and liked it. And they said, we will sustain this patent against any challenges. And we feel this is a valid an enforceable patent, um, so go forward with the lawsuit. Um, but on the other hand, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit up in Minnesota, uh, farm country, I guess, had um, had invalidated the patent. They said it uh, the invention would have been obvious, and so it was this circuit split at the time that that led to the Supreme Court taking the case and really um, revolutionizing the law of the patentability requirement of non-obviousness, non-obviousness. But that's just to give you an example of some of the inter-circuit conflicts that we don't have to deal with anymore. Uh, but today we have the one uniform um, appellate court in Washington, DC, which is not to say that there are not sometimes conflicts within the 12 judges of the federal circuit, but that's, that's a separate discussion. Uh, we'll get to that. But um, so the, um, the federal circuit um, will hear the appeal. Let's say that you try your patent infringement case in Silicon Valley, San Jose, uh, US uh, District Court for the Northern District of California. Any appeal in that case is not going to the Ninth Circuit, it's gonna to go to the Federal Circuit, which is um, physically located in Washington, DC. They're right across the plaza from the White House. And the same thing goes with uh, direct appeals from the US Patent and Trademark Office. All of those will go directly to the Federal Circuit. So um, this is a substantial power and control over patent jurisprudence. Um, in this country. And that's why I say that the Federal Circuit really, for all practical purposes, is the Supreme Court of Patent Law.
Speaking of that federal circuit court, um, you track all of those patent decisions. What data can you share? Do you notice any trends or hot areas in patent uh, case law development through your, your tracking? Yes, Morgan, uh, lots of activity to, to share. Um, I do keep track of all <clears throat> the precedential patent opinions issued by the federal circuit. And these are generally decisions of three judge panels and if they're precedential, that means they are the law. They are going to bind uh, subsequent panels, and they're going to be the, the binding precedent unless and until uh, overruled by the en banc federal circuit, the full 12 judges, um, which occasionally happens, but still rare, and rarer still um, if the Supreme Court should step in and, uh, and change the law. But um, Precedential patent opinions in calendar year 2020. By my count, we had 111, maybe 110, 111. Um, and this is in the pandemic year. In previous years, we were looking at 120, maybe 125. So the fact that the court produced 110 precedential patent opinions in the pandemic year when everything changed everything, all the procedures had to be virtual. Oral arguments are now being conducted telephonically, um, but there was no slacking off on the part of the Federal Circuit. And I think it's really, really commendable uh, how productive that they've been. So out of those 110 or so uh, precedential patent, uh, patent opinions, what were the issues that the Federal Circuit confronted most frequently? Well, in my front runner category, I'll name three issues. Uh, first of all, non-obviousness, which I already mentioned in reference to Graham versus John Deere. And this is just a very fundamental requirement for getting a patent that an invention is not only new, but also would not have been obvious to a hypothetical person of ordinary skill in the art when that invention was made. Um, these issues, the non-obviousness appeals very frequently these days are coming out of the patent office through appeals from board decisions in inter partes review. Um, we also see some coming out of the federal district courts, but the majority of the non-obviousness cases now are from IPR appeals out of the patent office. Uh, secondly, looking at my cheat sheet, oh yes, of course, patent claim interpretation. Very, it's a fundamental issue in any patent case, whether or not the issue is appealed. And it's just this basic question of what do the words in a patent claim mean and what is the proper scope that they should be given in the context of the patent? So um, what's the meaning of a word like a plurality or a user identification module um, standing alone in a patent claim, that word may be, mean nothing, but in the context of the rest of the patent, the written description, the drawings, occasionally the prosecution history at the patent office, and very rarely, uh, but possibly extrinsic evidence beyond those sources. And these debates uh, can literally be worth millions of dollars. The meaning of a single word, like a plurality, you know, is it two? Is it three? Is it a hundred? Um, it has to be decided in context. So that's always an issue. And it's, of course, one of my front runners, one of the court's front runners in 2020, and I'm sure in every year before that. Lastly, in 2020, an issue that has uh, created a great deal of division and dissension in the federal circuit between the 12 judges. And that is uh, section 101 of the Patent Act, patent eligibility. What are the, cat well, not what are the categories, but is this particular invention, does it fall within one of the statutorily uh, enumerated categories of subject matter that we grant patents for in the United States? And the words of the statute are historic and very broad and really undefined. Uh, you can get patents on processes, machines, manufacturers, 
and compositions of matter. And those are, those are the four categories of utility patent protection. Now, parallel with the statutory um, development, we have seen a, um, the judiciary through, through uh, court decisions develop a sort of a, a gloss on the statutory categories. And so there are these judicially recognized exceptions to patent eligibility. And they are uh, things like abstract ideas, laws of nature, natural phenomena. Uh, if you're Newton, you cannot patent the law of gravity. If you're Einstein, you cannot patent E equals MC square. If you're Archimedes, <laughs> yeah, I think that's who it was, you cannot patent the value of pi. Um, these, these constructs are fundamental building blocks and tools of research and science and technology, and they have to be um, out in the open. They cannot be fenced in by patents. And um, so it, it's really a kind of a fundamental policy decision with, without a lot of very clear guidance. We had some Supreme Court decisions um, in particular, the Mayo decision in 2012, which in my view, um, unfortunately injected a lot of ambiguity into this analysis of what's patentable subject matter and what's not. And all of this by way of background to talking about the very high number, about 12, I think, presidential decisions of the circuit in 2020 that dealt with this issue. And in particular, the, the most um, hot button case of those, I would have to say, is a case called American Axle. And you're gonna hear more about that. It's on petition for cert now at the Supreme Court. We don't yet know if the court will review it, and that might be good or bad. But <clears throat> uh, in that case, we had what on its face appeared to be you know, a very kind of basic technological industrial invention. Uh, this was a method to make the drive shaft for an automobile. And those drive shafts are hollow tubes of metal and they can um, vibrate in, in um, unwanted frequencies and in so doing create noise and we don't want that. So these inventors came up with a particular method of uh, tamping down or dampening uh, those frequencies in drive shafts. Um, so again, on its face, something that seemingly looked like traditional patent eligible subject matter, but the Federal Circuit in American Axle in a divided panel decision said that in fact, no, this was not patentable subject matter, because the independent claim that was at issue in that case really did nothing more than invoke a law of nature. And in this case, it's a law uh, known as Hooke's, Hooke's Law, uh, which is a mathematical equation that's been around for many, many years. And it relates the mass and stiffness of an object, like a drive shaft, to the frequencies at which it will vibrate. And so, of course, you would have to use Hooke's Law to develop this invention, um, but the Federal Circuit majority in American Axle said that that's really all that the claim um, was claiming, the, you know, the result of using Hooke's Law to dampen frequencies, nothing specific in terms of uh, structure or function to carry out this method. So um, I said that that's been a hot button case. Another member of the court has written in the past year that um, due to American Axel and I think some of the other 101 cases where the court's been divided, that the Federal Circuit is, quote, a bitterly divided court and that because of some of these decisions, the circuit is slowly, quote, creating a panel dependent body of law and destroying the ability of American businesses to invest with predictability. That's pretty uh, dramatic language. And I think the intent there is probably to get the Supreme Court's attention. As I said, that case, American Axel, is now on petition for cert, and there are uh, a large number of amicus briefs supporting the grant of cert in that case. 
Um, so keep an eye on that. You know, frankly, I'm not sure that Supreme Court involvement here is going to do us a lot of favors. It's another one of these, be careful what you wish for. Um, because the last time we heard from the court in the Alice case, 2014, and Mayo in, in 2012, those cases, as I said, injected some ambiguity that has sort of led us down this road. So um, very much uh, an issue and, and a case to keep, keep an eye on. So those three issues, non-obviousness, claim interpretation, and patent eligible subject matter were in the front runner category for the last year of Federal Circuit presidential cases. But we also um, saw just a myriad of other issues considered. Um, several cases dealt with questions of venue. What's the appropriate federal district court to file your patent infringement lawsuit in? And um, uh, some of these cases were answering questions left open after the Supreme Court's decision in 2017 in a case called TC Heartland. And so the Federal Circuit has had to decide all sorts of questions, like, for example, if a corporation maintains a computer server in a particular jurisdiction, is, is that tantamount to having an established regular place of business there? These are really questions of first impression that the Federal Circuit has had to grapple with um, in the past, uh, you know, two, three years since TC Heartland. And, and I think in that area has done a really good, very thoughtful job considering those, those questions of first impression. So also last year, um, we saw cases on attorney fees. Um, it's possible that the prevailing party in a patent litigation matter can recover its attorney fees from the other side if it can establish that the case was, quote, exceptional. And by that, we mean really exceptionally bad, either exceptionally weak on the merits or uh, involving some litigation misconduct that merits uh, the sanction of attorney fees. And again, we had a Supreme Court decision, Octane Fitness, in 2014 that I think um, opened the door, made it somewhat easier, not easy, but easier to recover, um, for a, a prevailing party to recover patent attorney fees in exceptional cases. So we saw several cases about that. Um, given the rise of inter-parties reviews at the patent office, I already mentioned non-obviousness quite often figuring into those appeals, but also some subsidiary questions um, the non-obviousness um, um, issue is often built on what the prior art disclosed. And in particular, what um, can, can be disclosures of various prior art uh, references, documents, information, events, can they be put together to make a case that the invention would have been obvious? Well, those references have to qualify as prior art under the statute, Section 102 of the Patent Act. So the, um, these IPR appeals are bringing these sorts of questions, which to me I think of as basic patent law 101, the kind of stuff I, I loved teaching when I actually taught patent law students. Um, has an invention been placed on sale too soon before the patenting process was begun? Um, a printed publication uh, is a particular document sufficiently publicly accessible to qualify as a printed publication such that it's prior art that's available to be, you know, to be used to invalidate someone else's patent. Um, you know, you get into a lot of questions with, with technologies. Um, what about a disclosure of information, maybe only in an oral presentation at a private conference or you know a very small conference but with a number of invited experts in the field or what if um, the um, high points from that discussion were posted temporarily on the organization's website but then removed would that qualify as a printed publication does it have sufficient um, um, accessibility by persons who are interested in, in getting that information. So uh, we saw a lot of those cases. Um, 
also a few uh, involving design patents and design patent protection has become seemingly very popular in the last few years. Design patents are kind of an odd bird. We're the only country in the world that has design protection within the patent system. And in, in my view, in the view of this author, it doesn't really fit very well. But again, that's another conversation. But consider um, design patents, which are covering the ornamental, the aesthetic exterior features uh, of an article of manufacture. So think about the, um, the shape of an iPad, the bevels, the placement of the home button on your iPhone and the uh, camera aperture on your iPhone. Can, can those sorts of ornamental designs be protected? So those are the sorts of questions coming up in the design patent cases. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, last year, just a couple of cases involving enablement. And enablement is another fundamental requirement for obtaining a patent and for um, uh, having a valid patent. And that is that it's not enough that an inventor just um, you know, come up with a novel and non-obvious invention, she also has to describe in detail that invention um, in sufficient detail that another person, again, our hypothetical friend of ordinary skill, could read the patent, understand it, and this is the key, make and use the invention as broadly as it is claimed, make and use the invention without undo experimentation. Uh, some trial and error is okay, but when it becomes undue, that's problematic. Um, so uh, a couple of cases on that in 2020, but all, already in 2021, a couple more enablement cases focusing in on the life sciences, on biotech. And I, for one, think this is uh, an excellent development, and I'll tell you why. In previous years, the Federal Circuit had relied on a related but independent and different disclosure doctrine known as the written description of the invention requirement. And I and many others have <clears throat> argued that that doctrine has a lot of problems, a lot of ambiguity, that um, it's really not the best tool for assuaging, assuaging the, the concerns of the Federal Circuit that oftentimes an inventor may be claiming too broadly over breadth in the claims. Um, to my mind, enablement is a more uh, fact-based, um, organized tool, more nuanced. We have recognized in the case law a series of factors, and I think it's just a much better tool uh, to use in these biotech cases to, to look at um, the sufficiency of the disclosure vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular claim scope. So I'm really delighted that the court seems to be honing back in on enablement rather than relying on written description of the invention. So um, for completeness sake, now let me mention <clears throat> two cases that the Supreme Court has said it will review, and that are currently pending, patent cases pending at the U.S. Supreme Court. And the first one, certiorari, was granted last year in 2020, and uh, that is a case called Arthrex, Arthrex, um, and that deals with the constitutionality of how we appoint the administrative patent judges who work in the patent office and who sit in three judge panels and decide these inter parties reviews and other matters uh, at the patent office. So that's, that's really a, a case about constitutional law and administrative law and statutory interpretation. It's not what I would call hardcore patent law 101. <laughs> in contrast with the issues on patent eligibility that are appearing in uh, the American Axel case, uh, which the court has not yet taken, but it well might. The 
other patent case that is uh, at the federal at, at the Supreme Court now, the court has agreed to review it, is one called uh, Hologic. Logic versus Minerva, or at the Supreme Court, I believe the parties are flipped, Minerva versus Hologic. And that deals with an equitable doctrine, a, a judge-made case law doctrine that's been around for a long time, known as Asinor Estoppel. So uh, what is this doctrine? Let's say I'm a scientist or an engineer, and I get a job with a tech company and, you know, I'm hired to invent, to make things, to do research, or work on new products, etc. So as part of the deal, as part of my compensation, um, I assign over to my employer any rights that I have in um, patent applications on inventions that I've developed while an employee or, you know, at any point during my employment, uh, any patent rights I'm, I'm assigning over. I'm essentially selling or assigning for value my rights. And, you know, let's assume maybe I am the inventor, the named inventor on some patents that the corporation obtains on something that I invented while I was working there. Great. Well, it gets complicated when a few years later, I leave that original employer and go to work for a competitor. Or maybe I leave and start my own corporation, my own research organization, um, which is going to compete against my former employer. And um, let's say that uh, in, in the outcome of that competition is that the former employer sues me and my company uh, for patent infringement. Is it proper for me to turn around and say that that patent uh, that I'm the inventor on, that I assigned to the original employer for value, to say that that patent is not valid. Um, you know, to basically say that what I assigned is now worthless, even though as an inventor, I, I took certain oaths um, and, you know, um, so there's, you can see there's some fundamental equity and fairness concerns and based on those concerns, the Federal Circuit has applied and continues to apply and sustain this doctrine um, as it did in the Hologic case um, from last year. And um, on the other hand, there are those who think that the Asinor Estoppel doctrine uh, really no longer has any validity, that it should be um, uh, abrogated. And the competing policy concern really was expressed by the Supreme Court back in, I think, 1969. They decided a case, uh, Lear versus Atkins. And that did not involve an inventor slash asinore, but rather a licensee of a patent who wanted to turn around and challenge its validity. And the Supreme Court said that, yes, that should be permitted, uh, that, that a licensee should not be stopped. Uh, so they got rid of the doctrine of licensee uh, uh, estoppel. And the thinking was that we want members of the public to be able to challenge bad patents. If there's invalid patents out there, we need to know about it. And, you know, frankly, who better than a licensee or, you know, even best of all, maybe an inventor. So uh, to, to, know, to know where a patent is, is vulnerable. So that's the issue in the Hologic versus Minerva case. Um, I just checked and uh, the briefing is, is ongoing, but oral argument has been scheduled in Hologic versus Minerva at the Supreme Court in April next month. Um, uh, so we'll presumably be seeing a decision uh, by, by the summer. So uh, that is my long-winded uh, synopsis of uh, the hot areas currently at the Federal Circuit in patent cases. Well, that was not, that was fantastic. I was telling Morgan, I think it's like the law school lectures that I've missed. <laughs> this is giving me a bit of nostalgia oh. in the best possible way. So before we dive <laughs> into the next question, I did want to make an, uh, an announcement. So people have asked about receiving a table of contents. So I will be sending out that documentation for you 
in the follow-up email after the session. So we will get that to you right away. Otherwise, are you ready for, I know that was a long answer, are you ready for another question? Not to put you on the spot, of course. Sure, no, I just had a little swig of water. It is water, so uh, I'm ready, yeah. Perfect. So you may have already answered this in a bit in your last explanation, but what are your thoughts generally about the quality of Federal Circuit's decisions? Well, I've, I've been reading the Federal Circuit's opinions for over 30 years now. And uh, let me say, as a, a preface, I, I have the greatest respect for the court and their work, as I've already mentioned. And I, I did spend two years there as a law clerk. And um, so if members of the Federal Circuit would like to make any comment about my writing and my treatise, I'd be more than willing to uh, to accept those those comments, but by and large, you know, I think that the federal circuit has done a, a wonderful job um, applying the patent law to cutting edge technology. You've got a court of twelve judges. Some come from a patent law background, or you know, we've got two judges on there that are PhD chemists. But, you know, we have other judges who were tax experts or war crimes or government contracts, and they have all uniformly stepped up to the plate and um, done a, a wonderful job uh, deciding patent cases, which really are by far the biggest chunk of the Federal Circuit's docket. Um, now, for those who are, are still listening in, I'm going to share with you my personal litmus test for uh, Federal Circuit opinions. And this is this is pretty crude, but um, here goes. I call it the looming lunch test. And what do I mean? Well, every day, every weekday at 11 a.m., the Federal Circuit publishes on its website any new presidential patent opinions. So that's not going to happen every day, but probably uh, a couple of times a week. And when those opinions come out at 11 a.m., I'm ready at my computer and um, I give myself a half hour, 30 minutes to very quickly read the opinion, uh, figure out what the key issues are, and then tweet. Uh, about the most important issue. There's usually more than one issue, so I really have to pick the one that I think is the most important. And so believe it or not, if an opinion is well organized, clearly structured, gives me some roadmap for understanding it, um, I can often do that in 30 minutes. I've been doing this for a while, um, which is not to say when I'm working on the treatise, that I only spend 30 minutes analyzing a case. No, 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 it's more like 30 days. But, um, but if I can do uh, my task, my analysis and tweet 280 characters within 30 minutes, I'm a ha happy camper. But if I cannot, if it's taking me 45 minutes to an hour to get that tweet finished, um, I'm very angry. In fact, I'm hangry hangry with an H. And the reason is that I'm a very early riser and I've had breakfast, you know, well before the sun came up that morning. And believe it or not, by 1130, I'm ravenous. So if it's a good opinion, uh, I get to have lunch at 1130 and all is well with the world. That's my personal litmus test. It's pretty silly, but uh, there you have it. I can certainly relate to that. I also get hangry at 11.30 nearly every day. So uh, I love that test. Um, we're starting to wrap it up here. Just a few more questions. Um, what is your advice on when and how practitioners should use your treaties? And do you have any tips for using the print version versus the online version? I know we've touched on it a little bit, but any further advice you have there? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, if if you're already familiar with a patent law doctrine and you just want to find each case that I discuss that deals with that doctrine, let's say if we're talking about non-obviousness, there's sort of a subcomponent known as motivation to combine. Motivation to combine 
the disclosures of references, prior art that would lead the person to recreate the invention with reasonable expectation of success. Um, so, you know, you could easily just go online and do a search. You're in fast case. You can do a natural language, you know, Google kind of search uh, or a more structured Boolean search and just hit, you know, every instance of motivation to combine that appears in my treatise. But I really encourage you not to stop there, particularly if you're not quite at such an advanced stage. Um, if you're just beginning to understand the concept of motivation to combine and you want to get a more overall flavor for what that means and how it fits in the overall structure for the non-obviousness analysis, I would urge you to go to the books, uh, go to the print treatise. And you know, you're know you going to, um, to see that doctrine explained in context and also very importantly, something I call the serendipity effect. You may be paging along and you know, a dozen pages later, you see another section on something known as analogous art. And uh, that's another sub um, uh, requirement for uh, asserting obviousness that the prior art references relied on either um, were pertained to the same problem or the same technology area. So uh, those are the kinds of, of uh, related but different doctrines that you might not otherwise pick up if you weren't searching for, um, uh, if you weren't using the print treatise. So use both. But let me, let me also say, I think this was mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of the updates, the most uh, frequently updated format, the, mo the most recent updates, you're going to find in the online version. Because it's, it's just very easy. Apparently, I can submit an, uh, a file, an update file to, uh, to Morgan, and it will be uploaded and available on the FastCase um, research service within 24 hours, barring some problem. But with the print books, I understand um, it's a much bigger um, uh, commitment to to issue print supplements to print books. And that's probably just going to happen once a year. So for the very, very latest developments, you might want to check the digital format of the treatise. Perfect. So we have one more follow-up question to that and then one last question. So the follow-up question is, what prompts you to issue an update? Is it, does it tend to be a big decision? Do you just have this um, motivation? You get inspired, so to speak? We would love to know. You know, I, I said before that this treatise is my curated um, um, version of, of the patent law. You know, what, what are the most significant developments? Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes just, uh, something strikes me as, as really important, just, just based on my, my experience. Now, clearly, if the Supreme Court takes an interest, you know, if there's a cert petition pending with lots of amicus participation, or let's say the, you know, I hear about a petition at the federal circuit, not yet at the Supreme Court, but maybe at the Federal Circuit for rehearing a case in Bonk. And I know it's a controversial area. If I have not already uh, analyzed and discussed that case in the treatise, I will certainly do so in an update. Um, you know, in the process of preparing this treatise for publication by Fast Case and Full Court Press, you know, there's a certain um, uh, timing, you know, the, the preparation, the, the copy editing, the organization, the proofreading, it takes a while. So um, what you're seeing in the print book is, uh, frankly, probably, you know, uh, not up to date in terms of today. Maybe, maybe it's a year out of date. But as I say, updates for things that are happening um, on the fly, you're going to find those in the digital version first. 
And then one final question. So I love, this is one of my favorites. So you are one half of the Chisholm Patent Academy, which you and Donald Chisholm formed in 2009. So can you tell us a little bit more about the Academy and what exactly does it do? I'd be glad to. So Don Chisholm and I were both full-time patent law professors and we both agreed that our favorite courses and classes to teach in, in law school were the small group seminars where you really had just 10 or 12 students sitting around a table and discussing and debating the issues. And that is what we have tried to re recreate with the Chisholm Patent Academy, except now uh, the seminars are for experienced patent practitioners. So we hold these seminars as, as live get togethers, you know, with, like I say, 10 or 12 participants sitting around a table with, with me and Don. And we get into it. We uh, talk about, you know, the latest blockbusters in patent law from the federal circuit, the Supreme Court. Um, we love to have participants who really want to argue with us, who challenge us. Uh, who are willing to debate these things. Um, I think we all learn from each other, which is, you know, one of the best features of a seminar. Um, and, and also there's a sharing of best practices. Our participants in the academy seminars really run the gamut from patent practitioners um, to litigators to folks who um, make their living from licensing and valuation of patents. And I'd say it's about a 50-50 mix of people from law firms versus in-house at corporations. But we really have uh, a wonderful time. And it's, I think it's just as much fun, if not more so, for me and Don to do these seminars as it is, hopefully, for the participants. So unfortunately, in the last year, because of COVID, we were not able to do any live uh, roundtable seminars. But uh, by the end of 2021, we are cautiously, very cautiously optimistic, uh, as Dr. Fauci would say, that we may be able to start up again and run some seminars possibly in the fall of this year. And we look forward to that very much. Perfect. Well, on that note, I want to thank you so much for doing this webinar with us today. Um, I know that Morgan and I are definitely, I'm going to put her on the spot. We have something we can do in the fall, Morgan, in terms of attending potentially one of these seminars at this academy. All right. I'm ready to go anywhere and do anything at this great. point, but that sounds great. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for, uh, for your time, Janice. And also, I know that we have a lot of questions that went unanswered. Um, where possible, we'll try to, to follow up with you. Um, yeah. And do you have any other closing Absolutely. remarks? Yeah. Yeah, I will just add that I will, uh, once more, I'll send the table of contents out in the follow-up email as well as the slides here. Once you receive the slide deck, you will have a link on the final slide that will allow you to uh, click directly into purchasing this fantastic, I don't want to, I almost want to say life-changing because I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> Definitely fantastic points of, of reference for all of those who are as excited as we are about patent law. So thank you so much for coming out. Expect the follow-up email in the next day or so. And we look forward to having you for our next session um, with us at Full Court Press and Fast Case. Thank you again, Professor Mueller. It has been the utmost pleasure to have you today. Oh, my pleasure as well. Thank you, everybody who tuned in. It was a lot of fun. And I'll be happy to respond to questions that you have that we didn't get to. Excellent. Thanks again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.